Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat, and it's already February, which means that it's also LGBT plus history month in the UK. So with that in mind, I've decided to look at the topic for today's video, the Molly Houses of the 18th and 19th century. Let's go. If you were to find yourself plopped down in 18th or early 19th century London, maybe you might have a mind to go in search of the Mollies and their houses. But to do so is not going to be an easy task, because at least without knowledge, you're going to see regular houses, coffee shops, inns and taverns. At street level, it will not be clear what you have stumbled upon. You need to be in the know. And once you go inside, perhaps you need the requisite introduction or to pass the correct tests. But should you do so, you will be inducted into a semi-clandestine world. The world of the Molly. The Molly should not be confused with the Mole. Moles were traditionally lower class females. Occasionally they were thought to be sex workers. Certainly by the standards of the day they were thought to be lacking in morality and class. If you look at my video that I made on Mary Frith, which I will leave linked in a card, she was accused of being a cut purse, occasionally of being a sex worker. But most famously she broke boundaries by cross-dressing. She is the figure in the play The Roaring Girl, where her character's name is changed to Mole Cutpurse. She is a mole, but we are here today to talk about mollies. There is a suggestion that the name Molly may connect with mole. Like the moles, these men were seen as being morally questionable, sexually voracious. However, others state that it comes from the Latin mollis, to mean soft or effeminate. Within the molly houses, some, if not all of the men, would be dressed in women's clothing. The molly houses, like the brothels, may have had the opportunity for men to rent these clothes, just as sex workers could rent, for example, a costume like Little Bo Peep to entertain their clients. It seems that these costumes could do double duty for moles and for mollies. Within the walls of the molly house, men would socialise, form relationships, fall in love, have sex. They would act out courtship rituals engage in marriage ceremonies and also, in some cases, mock births. In the White Swan on Veer Street, an ordained minister was on hand. He was fittingly named John Church and he was willing to officiate marriages between mollies. What is unclear is whether these marriages were expected to last a lifetime or a night. For the esteemed academic Richter Norton, these molly houses are evidence of the existence of a thriving gay subculture. He says the following. The legal records document investigations into about 30 molly houses during the course of the century. Considering that the population of London was only about 600,000 in the 1720s, having even just a dozen molly houses at that time is a bit like having 200 gay clubs in the 1970s. In some respects, the 18th century molly subculture was as extensive as any modern gay subculture. In some cases, the molly house was owned and operated by a molly themselves. This was the case with Miss Muff's molly house, which was operated out of Black Lion Yard in Whitechapel. Miss Muff was the alias for one Jonathan Muff. However, this was not always the case. In the case of arguably the most famous molly house to ever exist, Mother Clapp's molly house, the owner-operator was one Margaret Clapp. Mother Clapp's Molly House was based in Field Lane, near Holborn. The contemporary fame that is enjoyed by Mother Clapp's Molly House today is perhaps explained by the fact that it forms the title of Richter Norton's seminal book, Mother Clapp's Molly House, The Gay Subculture in England, 1700 to 1830. First published in 1992, and then republished in a second expanded edition in 2006. In addition, Richard Norton's book inspired the creation of this play by Mark Ravenhill, also called Mother Clapp's Molly House from 2001, which was directed by Nicholas Heitner. I mentioned earlier that if you made your way inside a Molly House, you would find many, if not all of the men, 
cross-dressed in women's clothing. Now, cross-dressing today is a loaded and very difficult term, but that is certainly what some of these men may have been doing. These were simply what we would recognise as homosexual men who dress up in women's clothing to enact love relationships with other men. In certain cases, there would be people in there who we would classify more as drag queens, people who enjoy the performativity of wearing female clothing while still identifying as a cis male. However, there certainly would have been people there who we would now recognise as trans women. But the issue is that that isn't how they would have recognised themselves, simply because they did not have that language. In the same way that we may refer to somebody as being homosexual, that's not a term they would have used for themselves because it didn't exist. For them, in the time when they lived, they had access to terms such as molly and the far more negative and dangerous sodomite. For some, the molly house would be the closest they could come to a safe space, a place of sanctuary. However real that safety and security was, it would be the only place that they could live out their true identities, dress in the way that felt right, love and act in the way that felt true. And so when they left the doors of the Molly house, they would put back on their men's clothes. They would wear their male gender identity and go about their life as normally as possible. But for others, this was not the case. And there is one figure that I want to talk about, who was known as Princess Serafina. Princess Serafina was the alias for the butcher John Cooper, who lived on the Strand. And while it seems clear that those around her were aware that she had been born a natal male, they still referred to her by using female pronouns, including Her Royal Highness. Indeed, Princess Serafina's neighbour, one Mary Poplet, herself the landlady of an establishment known as the Two Sugarloaves in Drury Lane, gave this account of her friend, saying, quote, I have known Her Highness a pretty while. She used to come to my house from Mr Tull that's Princess Serafina's official employer, to inquire after some gentleman of no very good character. I have seen her several times in women's clothes. She commonly used to wear a white gown and a scarlet cloak, with her hair frizzled and curled all round her forehead. And then she would so flutter her fan and make such fine curtsies that you would not have known her from a woman. She takes great delight in balls and masquerades, and always chooses to appear at them in a female dress, that she may have the satisfaction of dancing with fine gentlemen. Her Highness lives with Mr Tull in Eagle Court in the Strand, and calls him her master, because she was nurse to him and his wife when they were both in a salivation. Salivation was a mercurial cure for syphilis. But the Princess is rather Mr Tull's friend than his domestic servant. I have never heard that she had any other name than the Princess Serafina. In the case of Princess Serafina, I think it is all too easy to use her story as an example or even evidence that she inhabited a permissive culture. Her local community, which included Mary Poplet, seems to accept her, to recognise and respect her gender identity and the way she chooses to present herself to the world. In the case of Mary Poplet, she seems to be celebrating the fact that Princess Serafina enjoys going to masquerades and balls to dance with beautiful young gentlemen. So perhaps this speaks to a safety and a security at the time. People like Princess Serafina could live freely and openly, expressing their gender and sexual identity with impunity. Well, I think we need to be cautious of reading it in that way. While it is certainly the case that there is no evidence that Princess Serafina was ever prosecuted for sodomy, perhaps this is less about permissiveness and more about proof. There simply may not have been the evidence to prosecute her, and if there had been, she may well have been. If people of the time had been able to prove that Princess Serafina had engaged in sexual relationships with men, or attempted to have sexual relationships with men, then she may well have found herself up on a charge of sodomy. She may have been prosecuted, and even paid the ultimate price. Because, as we will see, as evidenced in the cases of both Miss Muffs and Mother Clapp's Molly House, these were not safe times, and danger was abroad. The principal danger came in the form of the Societies for the Reformation of Manners. These societies would employ spies and double agents, the double agents themselves being mollies, perhaps people who had fallen out with their friends in one of the houses, perhaps they were simply scared into working with these groups. They would go with them, take spies into these semi-secret spaces to gather information. 
they would then relay this information back to the societies. The societies would then form up mob groups who would go and raid the Molly houses. They would take the people they found there before the magistrates and have them prosecuted, some for sodomy, some for attempted assault by sodomy, and some, for example, in the case of Mother Clapp, for keeping a disorderly house. Mother Clapp's Molly house was raided and dismantled in 1726. She and a number of her clients were brought before the magistrates for prosecution. While there, evidence was heard against them. In particular, somebody giving evidence was a man named Samuel Stevens. He, we think, was a spy working for the Societies of the Reformation of Manners. And he says the following about his visit to Mother Clapp's. On Sunday night, the 14th of November, I went to the prisoner's house in Field Lane, Holborn. I found near 50 men there, making love to one another, as they called it. Sometimes they'd sit in one another's laps, using their hands indecently, dance and make curtsies and mimic the language of women. Oh, sir, pray, sir, dear sir, Lord, how can you serve me so? Ah, ye little dear toad. Then they'd go by couples into a room on the same floor to be married, as they called it. The door at that room was kept by Eccleston to prevent anybody from balking their diversions. Mother Clapp and those being prosecuted alongside her were found guilty. As punishment, they were put in the pillory, fined, and then subjected to up to two years in prison. For three of them, however, the punishment was to be greater still. They were taken to Tyburn to be hanged for sodomy. A milkman, Gabriel Lawrence, a furniture upholsterer, William Griffin, and a fellow Molly housekeeper, Thomas Wright, all lost their lives in this way and for this cause. Unfortunately, just two years later, in 1728, it would be the turn of Miss Muff's Molly House to face a similar fate. The Weekly Journal or British Gazetteer holds the following accounts of the raid, arrests and prosecutions. On Sunday night last, a constable with proper assistance searched the house of Jonathan Muff, alias Miss Muff, in Black Lion Yard near Whitechapel Church, where they apprehended nine male ladies, including the man of the house. They were secured that night in New Prison, and Monday morning they were examined before Justice Jackson in Aylith Street. John Bleak Corland was committed to Newgate, he being charged on oath with committing the detestable sin of sodomy. Records show that nine people were arrested in the aftermath of the raid on Miss Muff's Molly House. We don't know what happens to all of them. Two, fortunately, were acquitted at trial. Two more were found guilty and sentenced to be whipped. One found guilty and sentenced to a fine. And another, a gentleman called Thomas Mitchell, apparently became so distressed that he attempted to take his own life while in prison. There is an account of this attempt. It is distressing. So I'm going to leave a timestamp in this video if you want to skip it, because this does require a trigger warning. But the account of his attempt is as follows. He attempted and had near accomplished destroying himself, in cutting the great artery of his left arm almost asunder. But by the immediate help of some eminent surgeons he was preserved, though at the point of death, through the great effusion of blood. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the topic of this video. Had you heard about Molly Houses? And if you had, what did you know about them before I made this video? Do you have any plans to mark LGBT plus History Month? And if you do, what are you doing for it? Let me know all about it in the comments section down below. Or you can come and find me over on my social media. As always, I will leave the links to my Instagram and Twitter in the description box so you can follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel. And while you're there, why not hit the little bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.